the chairman, I like to request the founder of this institute. So Professor J. Srinivasan. And uh, he is a man having his uh, BSc training, IIT training. He went to New York, it is MS, and, Sa and then San Diego, I think, uh, Sanford University okay. for his PhD and worked in the NASA also. At so many years of training, he came back, established the institute. He the pro distinguished professor here and also atmospheric science and uh, climate change. And we are ever grateful in the absence of uh, our chairman, SK Satish, to officially welcome the chief guest and all this thing. And also he is a man with words. Whatever he says, implement it. And he never mixes with words. And also he is a man with, uh, for climate change, carbon footprint we say, I think by walking without having a car, you save about two tons of carbon per, per year. That's what we have to do it. He walks from here to home every day. From here to there. And uh, be, believe me, and uh, in addition to that, he's a man with uh, any academic work. Anywhere, he will just always uh, give a green signal to it and participate, propagating the knowledge. I think something great. We are proud to have him here. And he don't want to mention about it. And late uh, Nobel laureate, Sir C. V. Raman, was his uncle. And uh, with these few words, I request Professor Jirish Inuasan officially welcome the guests of our institute. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. As all of you know, uh, Dr. Paramesh organizes a monthly seminar on health and environmental issues for the past two years now. And so this will be the last talk of this uh, here. And so I welcome you all in Baba uh, Dr. Satish. And we have a great speaker for the last uh, speaker of this year. Uh, we have had speakers from all over India, very eminent speakers. Today we have a speaker from abroad, a well known uh, transplant surgeon, and I would say a chief of the old block. So I request Dr. Parmesh to introduce Dr. Anil Parmesh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Srinivasan, sir. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever the Commonwealth countries people are there, welcome you all. Our international president is there on website, Professor Ashwant Patil. Ashwant, welcome. And uh, the, as I said, this uh, today's topic is uh, jumping the chasm strategies to cope with the increasing U.S. kidney transplant wait list. To talk about this program, we have with us Professor Anil, and I just have to highlight a few of those things. That is my subject, as a matter of fact. Chronic kidney diseases, global mortality as of 2015, is 1.2 million increased by 32 percent since 2005. The economic burden is amounting to 2.3 percent of the annual annual health care budget. The rules for kidney diseases are complex and involving the environmental, biological, genetics, lifestyle, comorbidities, and socio-cultural factors. The global warming has increased the chronic dis kidney diseases. The study from Guatemala, sugarcane field workers have shown 30% of them have chronic kidney diseases. That has been stressed due to three reasons. Number one, heat stress and inadequate water intake for a hyperosmolality through the vasopressin glomerular injury, intake of fructose containing beverages causing hyperosmolality, and again, uric acid crystalluria, 
and excess physical exertion causing muscle injury, rhabdomyolysis, and uric acid crystalluria, and hemodialysis produces carbon emission seven times that of the average care of the patients. In addition, it is an expensive in energy and water consumption. Transplant seems to be logical with affordability and availability. To talk about this subject, we have with us Professor Anil Paramesh. And just a brief of it, I like to highlight. Anil Paramesh, it is MD, MBA of ACS, is a professor of surgery, urology, and pediatrics at the Tulane University School of Medicine. He is a surgical director for kidney, pancreas, and living donor of transplantation. He did his medical school in the Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, India. General Surgery Residency, North Oakland Medical Center, Wayne State University, Michigan, USA, and Multi Organ Abdominal Transfer and Fellowship in the Mount Sinai Hospital of Medicine, New York City, MBA in the Tulane University. Dr. Anil Parmesh has numerous publications and presentations at national and international meetings. He is the director of the Louisiana chapter for the National Kidney Foundation Board and a transplant advisor for the ESRD Network 13 Medical Review Board member, and is also a member of the Committee of Ministry of Affairs, the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, Standards Committee, and ASTS Legislative Regulatory Committee, for which he is the, currently the chairman. And he organizes extra mural educational courses and uh, simulations for healthcare professional he is the recipient of several teaching awards for these efforts and holds scholarship to help him to do this work. And welcome, Professor Anil. And to chair this session, Maudit is sent concluding remark, uh, uh, the remarks on this uh, talk. We have another eminent personality. I know his uh, father and also I know him very well too. He is none other than Professor Tarun Dilip Javali. He did his MBBS in JIPMER and MS in JIPMER and MS, uh, MCH in All India Institute, uh, New Delhi. Renal Transplant Fellowship, SCPGI. He is the Professor and Head Department of Urology, Andrology, Renal Transplant and Robotic Surgery at Ramaya Medical College and Memorial, at Memorial Hospital adjacent to our uh, uh, building. He is the chairman of the Board of Studies, Super Specialities, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences. He is a gold medalist in general surgery. A CKP Menon Best Paper Award he received at National Urology Conference held in 2012. And 2016 is the American Neurological Association uh, uh, Chakravarti Fellowship. 2017, Urological Association of Asia Youth Section Fellowship. 2017, again, Japanese Urological Association International Foundation Scholarship. He was invited National Faculty of the Laparoscopic Urological Training. He has got over 35 publications published in various journals. He is a member of a various Urological Society Association Global. Sir, welcome to you. I have a great pleasure extending other professors here and Professor Anil Kulkarni, sir. Thank you, sir for uh, attending. Dr. Jayoji Rao, he is the past president of the Commonwealth Country India chapter and a pediatrician, traumatizing pediatrician. And also, Swamitri Ranganathan, madam, thank you very much for attending the meeting. And uh, over to you, sir, to take over. You can call the person. Thank you very much for your time. And Anil, uh, as you rightly pointed, uh, I'm proud to say I'm his father. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Parmesh, sir, for the introduction, and I thank you for inviting me. Uh, welcome to all the participants who have come here. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, kidney transplantation is a subject which is close to my heart, uh, and uh, there is a lot of difference in the uh, way it is practiced uh, in the United States and in India. Though the science and art of kidney transplantation is almost standardized, the techniques are same, the immunosuppressants are same, but there are certain inherent differences. 
And uh, to talk about that, uh, I invite our uh, chief guest, uh, uh, chief spokesperson for today, uh, Dr. Anil Parmesh. Thank you. Dr. Jabi, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me today, uh, Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Daddy, and all the rest of you could make it here today. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how do we bridge the gap between those who need a kidney transplant versus those with versus the number of organs that are available. As we heard, kidney disease is increasing across the world, um, and it's only going to get worse. So we, we have to kind of change the way we think about how organs are procured, used, or even allocated, because it is a scarce resource. When you have a scarce resource, you have to figure out the best way to get the best bang for your buck. And that brings a lot of ethical challenges as well to it. Too. So I recognize that most of the year are not doctors and not medical backgrounds. So this is not really supposed to be a medical talk. This is going to be more of a logistics talk. We're going to talk about how do we manage a scarce resource. And this is true for any health related um, um, value, value added item that we have, right? Can you just be one of them? So a little bit about myself. I work at the Tulane University. Tulane University is a private university. It's uh, one of the oldest private universities in the United States. Um, it's been open since 1834. Uh, it started off with a medical school, but has since grown, obviously. It has a huge undergraduate campus. They have a law school, a business school, where I did my MBA. Uh, engineering school, uh, uh, School of Public Health, uh, art school as well too. So it's a pretty prominent university. We proudly like to call ourselves the Harvard of the South, but uh, I think that's a little exaggeration. But that's where I work. A little bit about how busy we are. This is our transplants from last year. There are three of us that are doing this. Uh, so we did a, among the adults, we did 183, 138 kidney transplant adults, uh, out of which 43 from living donors. Uh, we do pediatric transplants as well too. So we did 17 pediatric kidneys and one pediatric liver last year. Uh, 11 kidney pancreas transplants, when that's when you do both the kidney and the pancreas together, and about 17 liver transplants last year. So we average about 150 to 200 liver, uh, transplants a year between the three of us, so we stay pretty busy. So one of the questions that Dr. Srinivas asked me, and believe me, he's been asking me a lot of questions, and I've asked him to stop asking me questions because I want you guys to hear the questions that he's asking because this is what you should be learning from this. Uh, he asked us about how, what are the success rates for transplant? Does it really work? So transplant centers in the United States are very strictly regulated. Um, a lot of it, they, they judge you by several metrics, but one of the most important ones is how successful are you? And they want a one-year metric, like uh, what, what is your one-year survival? So you can see this is our, my report card from last year. And actually, it looks at the two and a half. It gets published every six months. So this is my last report card uh, looking at the two and a half year period before that. So if you look at the um, number of transplants overall, we did 232, 86 from living donors and from deceased donors. Um, and you can see what the success rate is for the one year. 96.4% uh, from all donors made it to one year. Uh, if, if they were from living donor transplant, all of them made it. And 94.4% from deceased donors. These are the number of organs that are still functioning after that one year. But I want you to look at the bottom part. This bottom part is a score, is like a rating system. It gives you five bars. It, um, and what's interesting is that three bars means you're as good as you're supposed to be. This is a risk adjusted calculator looking at uh, how good you are versus how good we expect you to be based on the population that you're serving, the type of transplants you're doing. And you look at the age, the, uh, the race of the population, what is the disease they have and stuff like that. And they give you like an expected survival. Um, so if you're as good as you are supposed to be, that's three bars. If you're a little better than you're supposed to be, then that's four bars. If you are way better than you're supposed to be, then that's five bars. But I want you to think about that. When you think about that as a layperson, everybody wants five bars, right? But it's always very, very difficult to get five bars because you are extraordinarily good. And once again, there's room to cheat over here, right? Because if you want perfect results every time, you will only choose the best patients. You will only choose the best organs to use, right? Because I want to make myself look good. So that's one of the downsides of having such strict regulation is that everybody will cheat. But look at the difference. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, three bars is 94%. Four bars is 96%. You know, just think about it. 2% gets you a whole different bar. Um, so if you're doing 100, about 100 transplants a year, that's just one patient, right? One, patient, one or two patients make a difference between that. So it really comes down to how selective we want to be about this because we want to get more bars. So this is one of the downsides of having a little bit more regulation. That's one of the questions you ask me, like, how do you guys monitor it and stuff like that? And how successful are we? Yeah, we've got really good success rates. If everybody can get in the high 90s, that's great, right? And imagine, what are we comparing this to? 
we should be comparing this to kidney failure. We should not be comparing transplant centers between each other because this report card is used for insurance companies and patients to choose which is the best transplant center they want. They can choose somebody with a 94% success rate or a 96% success rate. But in the big picture, the survival for dialysis patients is 50% for five years. Think about that. When you compare that to this, any transplant is better than being on dialysis. But why are we fighting for one or two percentage points? So this is the chasm that we were talking about. It is the difference between the number of people that need a, trans need a transplant versus the number of transplants and organ donors we have in the country. Now, most of what I'm going to talk about is what's happening in the United States, because that's what I know best. But I know a little bit what's going on in the other parts of the world. And, you know, Dr. Javali being here obviously can help uh, fill in the blanks of what, what's happening in India. But, um, you know, some of you are looking at this and saying, oh, look at this, and, uh, this is getting shorter. That's not because of kidneys. That's because of liver and hearts and lungs. They've learned to kind of... Uh, uh, ration out the organs. They said everybody can't get a transplant. They've learned to kind of prioritize some patients versus others. Uh, so they look at the utility of an organ, saying that some people are not worth transplanting. And we have to get to that point. Otherwise, this line is only going to keep getting worse and worse. And this chasm is only going to get worse. So you can see this getting better, but this is not because of kidney. This is because of liver, heart, and lungs. They've recognized that it's not worth some people getting a transplant, so they don't let them get listed or they won't give them a transplant. The kidneys keep going. So you can see how this is broken down by the number of people that need organs. And you can see the largest gap, this is the number of people that need a transplant, they're on the waiting list, and the number of organs that kind of become available. All the other organs have kind of started to equalize out. Kidney is not going to equalize out, and for the foreseeable future, it never will. So this is the chasm that we're talking about. This is a growing discrepancy, and we have to find a way to kind of overcome this barrier. But as we talked about, transplantation is a very, very, very complicated system. There are just so many things that go into it, starting from um, where does an organ donor, what kind of organ donor are we talking about? So a dead person in the hospital that potentially could be an organ donor. How do you decide which of the organs are recoverable or not? How do we decide, can we make those organs better? How do we decide who gets the organs out? Where do those organs go? How do we decide who's going to be the surgery? Uh, what kind of surgery do we get? Who's going to pay for it? And what about the medicines afterwards? So there's so many moving pieces that kind of affect the success rate. So transplant, it's not fair that everything gets placed on the transplant team itself because there's so many people before and after transplant that are taking care of these organs as well. Too. And it's a very, very, very expensive undertaking that, uh, you know, undertakes. It takes up a whole bunch of somebody's budget or even the national budget. As we talked about, in the United States, kidney failure is the single most biggest drain on uh, the Medicare budget. Only 4%, there's only about a couple of hundred thousand people in the United States that uh, are on dialysis, maybe at less than a million that are waiting for a transplant, but it takes up 10% of the whole Medicare budget. So if less than 1% of the pop of the population is taking more than 10% of the budget. That's a huge discrepancy that the United States government really wants us to do something about, and that's why they keep putting these regulations on us to mandate that we get better. So if you're going to try to narrow a chasm, what would you do? I mean, the easy answer is, that, yeah, let's just increase supply. Yeah, let's try to get more kidneys if we can. True. And the other side of the equation should be, well, maybe we should reduce demand. And as I told you, that's really not going to happen. You can't reduce demand. It's only going to get worse for so many reasons. We are living in an unhealthy age. People are much unhealthier than they ever were. We have obesity, diabetes, hypertension, which is only increasing. So we can't reduce demand. Maybe we can modify demand. So let's, get, let's use that as our cat for today. So we're going to talk about each of these things, but what can we do to modify demand? Well, we can always stay, take the high road and say, you know, prevention is better than the cure, right? Uh, maybe you could prevent people from getting kidney disease. If we had more basic primary care, if we didn't let people get diabetes and hypertension, we watched them and they didn't get, they won't get kidney failure. And that's the high road that we can kind of think in our mind is the, you know, euphemistic thing to do. But truthfully, is that really going to happen? It's limited how successful this has been. People have been trying this for years. Uh, we can make changes to how kidneys are allocated to kind of prioritize some patients versus the others so we can modify the demand. Uh, we can address disparities for race, age, and sex. Um, you know, black people in America are the most discriminated against for organ transplants, and it's not because you don't want to give them organs. There's just so many factors working against them, including the fact that matches. Um, most of the organ donors in the United States are white because there are more white people there, right? But uh, if you look only at genetic matching for transplants, a white person is going to match a white person better, right? So we have to take away some of the genetic matching so that black people can get in, be in the same match run list as well, too. So. Uh, we have to shoot ourselves in the foot just so we can kind of help what we believe is underserved people to kind of come up as well too. So there's a lot of ethical questions about how we can do this. So we've made some changes specifically because we feel it's not fair that race, age, and sex should be discriminated against. Uh, another huge problem in the United States is reducing discards. Um, we throw away a lot of kidneys. 
In fact, the United States is the worst in the world for throwing away kidneys. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But you know, if we didn't do that, with, you know, with, we, we could do, there'd be more demand for not so good kidneys that we're currently throwing away. And then, of course, regulation comes into it. Uh, how does the government kind of look in and monitor us to kind of make changes? So every time a rule or law, law comes out, right, our behavior is changed. That's what laws are made for, right, to change our behavior. Um, but there's always consequences that come on the side for that. We can talk about increasing supply. Once again, I'm going to say we're reducing discards. Uh, we, we'd have more supply if we weren't throwing away so many kidneys. Uh, we've gotten more aggressive about trying to use organs that we were scared about before. We use organs that have hepatitis C, organs that have COVID in them, or even organs that have HIV in them. We are using those organs right nowadays. Desensitization, when somebody can't get an organ because they are very highly sensitized, meaning they've been exposed to proteins from a, that donor, so they've got antibodies against a particular donor, they can't get that kidney. But maybe I could treat them to bring down those antibody levels and then sneak a kidney in there and uh, see how that works. That's an option. We can do kidney swaps. That way, that's where we can kind of swap kidneys between each other. So if I'm not a match for my loved one, they can't donate an organ to me. Maybe I can swap a kidney to somebody else and they can get a kidney. We are now using kidney pumps, whereby we take the kidneys and put them on a pump to kind of uh, let blood or uh, preserve the solution flow through it. And that kind of helps recondition the kidney and allows us more time to find a place to put that kidney. Because once the kidney is taken out of the body, it only has a limited shelf life in a city in a bucket of ice. I know what a lot of you maybe want to hear about is xenotransplants. We have started to take organs from animals and put them into humans. Uh, for the first time ever, it was done as a proof of concept this year, and I'll talk about that as well. And of course, the future is starting to come as well. So people are experimenting with 3D printing of organs, uh, and maybe that's be something we could do in the future as well. All right, so let's go into detail for these things. So we want to reduce the need for transplants. You know, retransplants are rising, so many transplants have a shelf life too, even at you know, good kidney transplants, you know, it's only going to last so many years. I tell my patients, a uh, good dead person's kidney usually lasts about six or seven years in the U.S. A, a living donor kidney lasts about 10 to 15 years, but that's not all, right? If somebody who's in their 20s or 30s and needs a transplant, they might need two or three transplants over their lifetime. So the number of people that are needing a second or third transplants are rising. You know, I transplanted somebody, it was a fifth transplant. He started when he was two years old, and we've been transplanting ever since because those kidneys are only lasting five or six years, and they want another transplant. So obviously these are more expensive. The cost to the government is going up because of this. The second thing that was happening, and I'm very proud that we were able to fight this, is uh, uh, insurance was stopping for these patients after three years. So if you have ki kidney failure, you automatically got insurance in the United States. That was one of the uh, pitfalls, I mean, like one of the uh, parachutes they had for you, but they would only give you that for three years once you got a transplant. So the medicines that many of these patients need for transplants are very expensive. and um, the, point, the government's point was that, well, I'm paying for three years. By that time, you should have recovered and found yourself a job and get your own insurance. But insurance is so difficult that these patients are so fragile that they really can't be gainfully employed. So many of these patients remained on government insurance. And after three years, when it stopped, they couldn't afford the medicines, they would lose their organs. So we actually were part of a team that fought with the government. And we finally, this year, we were able to get the government to change that plan, say that it's more expensive for them to kind of fall off the cliff and get a transplant again. It's much cheaper for them. Just pay for the medicines. You'll actually save a whole bunch of people money. And uh, it's, it works out. It turns out they serve $700 million a year they'll save if they just did this. So once we show them the budget, we kind of show them math about this, they finally agree. And this last thing, which is a little bit more controversial, is which, you know, if we want to prevent kidney disease from happening, um, why don't we just give everybody insurance once the kidney function goes below a particular level? Uh, kidney, the, this insurance that I'm talking about comes in after you start dialysis, but isn't it too late for them? If you give them insurance before kidney failure actually happened, maybe we can actually, many of these people don't have doctors because they don't have insurance, but if they had insurance where the kidneys are starting to fail, maybe we could kind of catch them that time and prevent them from needing a transplant. So this is a little bit of like a reach as well too, but this is some of the stuff that we're talking about that maybe we can help people and potentially reduce costs. Allocation changes. So there have been so many changes to how kidneys are allocated. Previously, it used to be the, I mean, the easy thinking is that local organs should stay locally. So if there's an organ in Bangalore, it should stay within Bangalore. But a lot of people kind of said that's not fair. You know, there are, there's huge discrepancies in how people get organs or how long people have to wait for an organs in different parts of the country. So they said we have to have more of a nationalized system and state boundaries or city boundaries should not stay fixed. Because if you live one mile outside that boundary, that's not fair. So what, they, what we do now is a 250 mile radius. Uh, so as you can see, it crosses multiple state boundaries. So let's say, uh, uh, so if you're in two, within 250 miles of wherever that organ is originating, let's say there's an organ donor right there. And if you lived within this radius, and look at how many states are covered, there are like six different states are covered. If you're within 250 miles of this, 
and you have the highest, you're the most the person with the highest scope with it, you will get that organ. So no, if you're trying to get away from state boundaries, and if, if it's not visible, possible within the 250 mile radius, it goes out of 500 miles. So it goes in what we call concentric circles. The second thing we've done is we've given people a scoring system. Uh, it's not fair that everybody can't be equal. So everybody gets what's called a CAS score. A CAS score stands for a kidney allocation score, and it's kind of like a very complicated geometric number that's calculated looking by uh, how old you are, how long you've been on dialysis, what is the cause of a kidney failure, what is your race, um, you know, do you have hepatitis, do you have HIV, all that kind of stuff gets you a higher score, gets you, modifies your score. So it's a very logarithmic equation that we just put in these numbers, it gives you a score, and where that organ becomes available. And you get proximity points too, if you live here, here versus here, this person will have more points because they're closer to the organ. So it's a, it gets, a, you, people get a CAS score every time an organ becomes available. Here's the 500 mile radius I talked about, if, the, if you can't find the 250 miles. But here's the interesting thing. When this first came out just a couple of years ago, you know, the 500 mile, I guess, makes sense. But look at us. This is Florida. Look at Florida. I mean, 500 miles to them is the ocean. They, they can't get fish organs, right? Like, they, they said this doesn't benefit us at all because this doesn't change us. You're getting Florida organs are staying in Florida. But now that they've gone, if they go to a 500 mile radius, they're like, it's the middle of the ocean. This changes nothing for us. So there are some downsides to doing this, of course, too. If you're a coastal area, um, you know, you're 500 miles, that side is just the ocean. You can't get any organs from there. All right, then we want to talk about racial disparities. Uh, like I said, there's huge discrepancies between races, who, can, who comes in the running for an organ versus not. You recognize it, so we've had to make changes to the allocation system so we can modify the demand. So we began emphasize, trying to de emphasize race in the algorithm. Uh, you know, I was talking today about uh, blood type discrepancies and, uh, you know, how what we can do to, uh, you know, overcome this. African Americans tend to predominantly have blood type B, and blood type B is the hardest to get an organ for because uh, there's so few B donors out there. So you can potentially take a blood type. Blood type A can be broken up to A1 and A2. A2 is kind of like a little less A. It's, it's closer to O. So people normally people with blood type A should go to blood type A. O should go to blood type O. But because you're trying to recognize that African Americans have blood type B, and it's very hard for them to get that. Some organs in A2 and blood type O are automatic. Are you know, prioritize for blood type B people as well, too. They can be in the running for that. Um, another thing that transplant centers get uh, is that we get a risk credit if you transplant an African American recipient. So we actually actively look to transplant an African American because I'll get uh, my, those four bars, I'll actually get a little bit more score if I transplant a black person because they are harder to transplant. The government recognizes this. Age discrepancies. So here's where we have to be a little utilitarian and we kind of have to draw the line somewhere. You know, for many, for a long time, we kind of believed it's not fair that a 70-year-old person is on the same waiting list as a 20 or an 18-year-old, right? Think about it. I mean, an 18-year-old theoretically should get a better kidney because they're younger, they can have a family, they can get a job, they can actually contribute to society. I mean, a 70-year-old, yeah, there are many 70-year-old people at work, but, uh, but there's a lot of, many of them are like retired at home, not doing much, right? So all the, for them to, to have a better retirement, that's not, doesn't make fair. So we've had to kind of make that call saying that we've got to make, we've got to pull the line somewhere. So... Recipients, aside from that CAS score we talked about, also get what's called EPTS score. It stands for Estimated Post Transplant Survival Score. And it looks at how old are you? Do you have diabetes? Have you had a previous transplant? How long have you been in dialysis? Um, and it, it's kind of like, a, think of it as a rank from one to 100. So the higher the rank, the worse you are. So if there are 100 people, this would be your rank. Think, think about it. A kid, so the same way we score the donor, we rate the donor. So KDP stands for the Kidney Donor Profile Index. And that's a score that goes once again from one to 100, like a rank, one to 100. And it looks at 11 different variables based on how old is a donor, what do they die of, do they have any comorbidity, stuff like that. So now what we do is we kind of match the kidneys for each other. So the top 20% of kidneys will always go to the top 20% of recipients. So if you're above 55 with diabetes and stuff like that, you will never get a young kidney anymore. Because uh, he said, listen, we have to draw the line somewhere. 80-year-old, I mean, a 70-year-old can't be on the same list as an 18-year-old. 18-year-old has to get priority. And this is how, this is the sequence that we prioritize in. The top 20% of kidneys, you can see, first of all, the highly sensitized people, people that are very difficult to match, they get a lot of priority. If you're a very good genetic match, you get it in the top 20%. If you've been a previous living donor, you know, now you need kidney failures, you'll get a priority. Pediatrics always gets priority, so in the top 20%. So you can see the top 20% of kidneys, 20 to 35, 35 to 85, and the last 85%, uh, the, the, uh, the ones that are the last bottom 15% of kidneys. These are transplantable kidneys, believe me. These are not bad kidneys. These are the, but if you had 100 kidneys to transplant, somebody's got to be in the bottom 15%, right? All right, so we got to talk about reducing discards. And as I mentioned, the United States is the worst in the world. These are the kidneys that are 
recovered for transplant. So somebody obviously thinks he's a good enough to use, right? But then when they get offered out of people, we're turning them down. We're not taking them. And look at the rate. I mean, we are like almost double most of the world. In fact, last year it was this was 21%. 21% of kidneys that we are recovering for transplant, we are throwing away. We don't want them. And that's a huge problem, right? That's we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of kidneys that are not being used. And if you look at it, most of the kidneys that are being thrown away are from the bottom 15%. These are like tend to be older people like uh, or kidneys that have some comorbidities. So we know these are all the kidneys are being used. But you know, there's a significant overlap over the above the ones that are being discarded and the ones that are being used, right? So there's a huge area of people of kidneys that potentially could have been used, right? And it doesn't make sense that we say these kidneys are discarded because somebody's using them. So there is an overlap between ones that we're discarding versus ones we're using. And why is that? A lot of it is because the regulations that we have. We are scared to use these kidneys because we get punished. So this is how, how much kidneys are expected or are expected to work. So if you have this is um, um, so, so this is KDPI one. This is like a kidney that has scored a one percent of that KDPI, like it's a one percent kidney. This is how good it's supposed to be, and it's how long it's going to last. If it is KDPI ten, it works up to here. And you can see as this KDPI score, then as the kidney gets older or worse. You can see this is cool. You can see how, how long these kidneys are expected to work, right? And the KDP at 99, like if there was 100 kidneys, this was the 99th. That is about an 85% like one year success rate. Okay? And you can see that there's a downward uh, success rate how, how these kidneys work. So look at this. And this is dialysis. The red bars are dialysis. This is what we should be comparing ourselves against to. So people who are on dialysis after one year, two years, three years, and five years, you can see how many of them are staying alive. How many? So any of these kidneys, even the worst kidney is still better than being on dialysis, right? So look at this red line. That is where, that is the line we're supposed to keep. That is how good the government wants us to be. So think about that. If I'm like mandated to get that result, how many of these kidneys do you think I'm going to take? Not very many, right? That's part of the problem as well, too. So if you're mandating us that you get such a high rate and you want 100% success rate, we're never going to we're, ne we're never going to use these kidneys, or we're going to have very constrictive, uh, restrictive practices to take these kidneys. But that's not what we should be comparing ourselves to. This is what we should be comparing ourselves to. So uh, the, well, I, as you know, Dr. Premier said, I chair the Legislative Regulatory Committee for the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. We have frequent meetings with Congress and uh, the Senate. I go to Washington, D.C. every six months to kind of, you know, lobby with the government. This and, and we keep telling them, take away that scoring system. That just compare us to this. As long as it's statistically significantly better than this, we are still saving lives and we're not going to be throwing away kidneys. So ethical conversation over there. So, um, we made some regulatory changes as well too. Starting in Jan of this year, uh, transplant centers will now be graded on waitlist mortality. So if somebody is on my waitlist for a transplant and they die, I get punished for it. So what do you think I'm going to do because of this? I'm going to not list so many patients aggressively anymore because that can hurt me. So somebody asked me the question like, well, what do you do? Do you have an age limit? I'm like, I don't really have an age limit. I go by a physiologic limit. It's really not how old you are. It's how sick you are. So I, the oldest person I transplanted was 85 years old, but I was a really healthy 85 years old, and they came with a living donor. So there'll be, there was going to be no waiting time. They came to us, they, they were ready to go, they're pretty healthy, and they had a living donor. I could do the transplant in one month, you're good to go. But if you're 75 years old, you have a heart disease, and you've had no dialysis time to get your score up or something, there's no way to, no, there's no chance you're going to get a transplant. And if I put you on the list just to make you feel better, and you die, I get punished. So we've got to change some of that. So that's going to change our practice because this happened just this year. That's going to change a lot of our behavior too. That we're going to take off people from the list because um, I, I, I don't want to get punished, right? If I get punished, my my, my transplant center is going to suffer. Um, and that's partly what the government wants. They don't want you to kind of mess up this gum up the system too much because they recognize there's there's too much of a bottleneck. So this will hopefully reduce some of the bottleneck is what they think. Uh, the the point of this is they they want to design better communication between the dialysis centers and transplant centers. Uh, these are two different you know silos whereby dialysis centers are in one part of the, the city and the transfer center in a different part of the city, and we don't talk to each other necessarily. So they want better communication between us. Um, and like I said, the unintended consequence of this is that uh, I'm going to, a lot of people are going to not get offered transplant, or they're going to be taken off because there's no chance they're going to get a transplant. All right. So now that we talked about reducing the demand, we're going to talk about some of the cooler stuff we're doing now to increase the supply. We are using organs with hepatitis C. You know, hepatitis C was a scary disease. You know, if you don't take care of hepatitis C, it's a virus that attacks your liver. You can get cirrhosis, liver cancer, and stuff. And people died. It actually was the most common reason for needing a liver transplant. But 
over the past 10 years, there have been new medicines that have come out for hepatitis C, which are actually really, really good. They have a 98 to 99% success rate. There is no medicine for any disease in the world that has such a high success rate. So because that, that's been a boon for us. So what we do now is we tell people, list yourself for hepatitis C kidney as well. I'm going to give you a disease, but I'm going to cure it afterwards. But the kicker is that I'll get your kidney faster. If you're willing to take a hepatitis C kidney, chances are you'll get a kidney faster. And that's one of the reasons people take this. And there's another plus to this as well, too. You know, you may or may not know about there's a huge opioid epidemic in the United States. Uh, actually, the, one of the most common reasons for deaths for organ donors in the United States is because of drug overdoses. People are dying of drug overdoses, you know, by the hundreds of thousands. Um, but how old do you think these people are? I think these people are in the 20s and 30s. So these are actually young people that don't have hypertension, they don't have diabetes, the two diseases that actually attack the kidney, but they have hepatitis C because they were doing drugs or something. So I tell the people, get an organ from a hepatitis C person, let me give you a disease, but I'll cure you too, but I'll get you a good kidney at the same time. So uh, that's been a new thing we've been doing for the past you know, five or six years, and that's actually been very successful. Uh, Long-term success rates are pretty good too. So I told you only we've been doing for the past 10 years, but you know, this, this study came out looking at uh, 2,500 uh, hepatitis C positive donors, like you can see the long-term survival is just as good as those that did not get a hepatitis C kidney. So it's just as good as any other kidney out there if you think about it. It does require a little bit of extra work up front, but if you can make that work, the long-term success rates are just as good as any other kidney. We're also starting to use COVID organs. So when COVID first came out in the United States, this is in the beginning of 2020, uh, transplant centers had to shut down. Um, most of them between March and June of 2020, uh, most transplant centers are shut down. So because of that, in that report card I talked about, they don't count any transplants during that, that time because most programs in the country were shut down. And then there was a lot of controversy in the country about what do we do about COVID testing versus vaccinations? You know, we just previously we just had the antigen test or so PCR test would take several days to come back. Um, and we would not know the results of that. So there's no way I could get an organ from it from somebody and not know what the COVID testing was because the results were just not available several days and those organs would pass on. So. Now testing has gotten faster. Uh, we now have COVID vaccinations where, you know, that kind of gives you some protection. So we have recipients who've been vaccinated against COVID and we have rapid COVID testing. We can kind of tell the uh, status of the donor and you can have this happen. Um, you know, cycle, we've kind of modified uh, protocols over the you know past couple of years, whether we should look at cycle times, should we look at whether the recipient's vaccinated, did the die, donor die of COVID or this happened to be COVID positive? Because that's a big thing too. We find that many people who are in the hospital for a different reason, a heart attack, we check them the COVID positive because they're just carriers of COVID or whatever. So um, all that makes a difference. But you can see the number of COVID positive donors that we have. So these are COVID positive donors that we use in the United States has you know, exponentially gone up. So everybody's starting to use these COVID positive organs now too. So we're not as scared as COVID as we used to be. And long-term survival rates have been pretty good as well too. This uh, published, I think, a couple of months ago, uh, looking at the data, national database up to September 21. Uh, they looked at COVID positive versus negative, and they actually looked at short-term survival rates and said that there actually really was no difference because everybody was scared that these people would catch, catch COVID immediately and die, and that's actually not happening. We're using HIV positive organs, um, and the, the experience in the United States came from actually from South Africa. In South Africa, I, I don't know this to be completely true, but I heard some statistics where but one out of every five people is HIV positive. There's that much HIV prevalence in South Africa. So transplant surgeons in South Africa said, listen, I have no choice. I have to use HIV positive organs because uh, everybody has HIV here. I can't help it. And, you know, they published their results many years ago and they had excellent results. So the United States are like, well, if they can do it. Why can't we do it? And we can make us a little bit better, right? Uh, but it was illegal, you know, because of a laws that were signed in 1984. The only disease that you could not transplant somebody for was HIV. Uh, because everybody is so scared of HIV in, in the 1980s. I mean, I could take an organ with COVID or Ebola, and that would not be a problem, but I could not use the HIV organ because it was against the law. So many of us, you know, lobbied uh, the government, and in uh, 2013, President Obama signed the HOPE Act, which is the HIV Organ Policy Equity Act, so that we could now use HIV organs. And the first HOPE Act transplant was done in 2016, um, and but it's still considered a research protocol. So any transplant center that is using a HIV positive organ has to be done under an IRB. Um, so that's what we do as well, too. Uh, the only issue that we've noticed with using HIV, transplanting patients with HIV or using HIV organ, organs is that uh, they tend to have a high risk of rejection. And many of the medicines that we use for HIV can interact with the medicines that we use for transplant as well, too. So that could be a problem, but you just got to watch them closer. 
Uh, this was published uh, last year. I uh, can just to kind of show you the number of transplants being performed under the whole pack. These are HIV positive donors to HIV positive recipients. Uh, you can see progressively increasing. And if you look at the graph survival, it's actually pretty good whether you're HIV positive versus negative. And uh, but rejection is an issue, but we still think a higher rejection rate if those are if the donors HIV positive. And we believe that even though we think HIV causes AIDS, which is immunodeficiency, it actually revs up your immune system a little bit, so it predisposes you to rejection. So you've got to have you actually have to watch these patients a little closer. Next, we'll talk about desensitization. Uh, desensitization is where I make your body less sensitive, sensitized, so that you can accept an organ without rejecting it. Um, about 12% of the population of the kidney waitlist has a PRA of above 80%. A PRA is a panel reactive antibody, and it's a measure of how sensitized you are. And think of it as a rank again from 1 to 100. The higher the score is, the more sensitized you are. So women who've had multiple pregnancies or somebody who's had multiple blood transfusions, you develop antibodies. And it's kind of sad for women as well, because when a woman carries a baby, she develops antibodies against that baby. So we've had situations where a child cannot donate to a mother because the mother's developed antibodies against that child because she carried that baby for nine months. You know, it's you know one of the shames of life that we have. But um, if you're if you're if you have an antibody level of 80, above eighty percent, that means less than twenty percent of the population potentially is a match for you, and that makes it really hard. So it's harder to match these people, whether it be deceased or living donors. But what we can do is we can remove some of these antibodies so that you, we can make what was incompatible before compatible. There's lots of strategies for doing this. Uh, there's no, there's actually no randomized trials comparing all these protocols. Um, I was in Argentina a couple of months ago for the Transportation Society meeting there, and there's actually several papers from India that have really, really aggressive protocols, and they have good success rates. India actually is much more uh, progressive about this in the United States because you guys have to use more living donors because you don't have that many uh, deceased donors over here. So you guys are kind of forced to be more aggressive than we can be. So I saw some really interesting papers from India. I'm very impressed with what you guys are doing over here. Um, and of course, the protocols may vary if you're using a living donor, which is a planned operation, versus a deceased donor where you're just on the waiting list waiting for an organ. We don't know when that's going to happen. This is a busy slide. I know this. I just gonna, I'll just point out a couple of things over here. So you've got somebody who's highly sensitized and you, you kind of want to desensitize them. You kind of look at, do they have a living donor? Yes or no. If it's a living donor, then you can plan for this. And what you can do is you can do treatments. That kind of use, most commonly use the IDI, which is antibody. We infuse any blocking antibodies into them. We give them medicine that kind of kill off the antibodies. So you can do that kind of stuff to make a class match positive. Uh, for, uh, negative, so it's a compatible class match. And, but that's if a living donor, so you can plan to do this. But the problem is if you don't have a living donor, you're just going to be on the waiting list and you don't know when an organ is become available, then it kind of gets harder to do it. And you can do some of these treatments, but then you wait for six months, and if they don't get a transplant, do it again. But the problem is insurance companies give us a lot of problem of paying for this because they don't want to indefinitely pay for these expensive treatments. With living donation, it's easier because you can actually time the operation. These are protocols across the country in the United States, and as you can see, there's so many different variations. All of them kind of do somewhat the same thing, but how strong a medicine they use and how long they do it is different between different parts of the country. What are the outcomes of doing this? Well, because you're desensitizing and you're kind of bringing down somebody's antibodies, they can come back up again. There's nothing that's going to keep them down forever. Uh, so rejection rates are slightly higher because you have to give them more medicines to keep them suppressed. The chance of infections get higher as well, too. Long-term outcomes are not as good as if you were actually were a match. Uh, the cost obviously could be higher because you've got to give them upfront all these extra treatments to uh, make them a match. But still overall, remember the big picture. What you're fighting is dialysis. What you're fighting is kidney failure. And this is still better than staying on dialysis. And that's what we need to convince the government and the insurance company sometimes. All right, next we're going to talk about kidney swaps. About 25% of people that need a transplant and have a living donor are not a match with their loved one. It could be a husband and a wife, it could be a brother and sister, it could be a child and their mother. Uh, they can't be a match with each other. But what if we could kind of swap kidneys? You know, if, if we can get a couple of people that are willing to kind of exchange kidneys between each other, maybe we can swap kidneys and everybody can get a transplant. Um, you know, the easiest ones is just a two-way swap where, you know, this person swaps to this person or a three-way swap where you down here to down here and this person goes to this person. Those are the easy ones to do. But as you know, we, as we've gotten better at doing this, we've kind of gotten uh, bigger and bigger and more aggressive how we do this. And this is called a domino exchange, where we kind of find somebody that comes to us saying that, hey, just take my kidney. I don't care who you give my kidney to. I don't know if that's illegal in India. Is that even illegal? Uh, an altruistic donor? No, altruistic donation. Yeah. Okay. So altruistic donation is where somebody comes to us. Okay. 
So an altruistic anonymous donor donation is where somebody comes to us saying that, hey, take my kidney. I don't. I just want to donate my kidney. I don't care who you give my kidney to. They don't. They're not. They don't have any designated person. It's kind of when this first started, you're like, are you crazy or something? We have to get them a psychiatric evaluation and stuff like that. But we still do. But uh, but it's it's the ultimate form of charity, right? These people have already given money. They've you know gone to the temple. They've you know done stuff. But there's nothing like donating part of your body to save somebody else's life. So. We do get these a couple of times a year. So if we get something like that, then I can start a chain of people that keeps kind of that is continuous. It doesn't have to keep stopping, right? I can keep that going to a point where we do it. We call it the our need chain, which is that for non-simultaneous extended altruistic donation. Once again, it starts with one person who's a non-directed donor, and as this keeps going on, we can keep this going on forever. But let's say I, I get these people set up and do the transplant, but you know this person has not. So we don't want another uh, match to this person. I keep them waiting. I call this person a bridge donor, and we take another couple of months to find more people that want to participate, and this person bridges the gap. So th these are these theoretically, this is all supposed to happen simultaneously, but now that we're doing non simultaneous chains, we can keep this going on perpetually. Uh, this has gotten so popular whereby the government has programs for doing this, but there's a lot of private industry that does this, and as you can imagine, private industries tend to be better at kind of making stuff more seamless. So. The National Kidney Registry is a, is a private company that actually facilitates kidney swaps across the United States. They charge a fee for doing this, of course, but they are actually currently the largest, uh, you know, organization that is uh, arranging kidney swaps across the country. Um, and this, that's how many transplants they did. I, I took printed this about a month ago. That's how many transplants they facilitate in the last five, uh, ten years. Look at that. Next, we talk about kidney pumps. So when we take a kidney out of a body, it has a limited shelf life. It sits in a bucket of ice, and uh, we've got to find somewhere to put it in. And most of the times, you're trying to get those kidneys into somebody else's body within 24 hours. Uh, but lots of times, if it goes beyond that point, we kind of turn it down or we discard the kidney because like it's too long, we can't use it sitting there. But now we can actually put it on a pump. Uh, MP is machine for fusion. Uh, there's, and there's a lot of benefits to that. If you put in a pump, you can actually put preservative solution to it. You can let the kidney recover. Because the kidney might have what we call AT, and the kidney's kind of gone to shock a little bit, you can kind of let just a gentle flow through to kind of open up the kidney again so it starts to work again. You can actually measure the effluent, the stuff that's coming out of the kidney to kind of look at uh, toxic metabolites to see if the acidosis is going down and stuff like that. You can me measure mitochondrial uh, 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 products to kind of see if the kidney is regenerating and stuff like that. So there's lots of benefits to doing that. Uh, there are some benefits. Uh, it uh, l improves the chance that the kidney is going to work and stuff like that. You can use it both for diagnostic purposes and therapeutic purposes. I, if the kidney doesn't improve on the flow, I know it's not going to be a good kidney, so that's I can use for diagnosis. Um, but by opening up the kidney, I can use for therapeutic purposes as well too. So it's obviously more expensive, so there's increased upfront cost of doing this. But the long term, there could be cost savings if we can make the kidney work better, and if we can use more kidneys, then yet yeah, long term this might actually be of some benefit. There's different kinds of pumps out there. HMP is hypothermic machine perfusion. That's just when they use cold preservative solution. There's something called normal thermic perfusion, where we use blood instead of uh, preservative solution. Uh, and that might be potentially better because um, the organ was used to blood. It's still like blood, right? Um, and this is what we call subnormal thermic perfusion, where it's kind of hybrid of both. We're now using pumps for livers as well. Um, this is a liver pump that we kind of wheel into the operating room, and you can see how we kind of attach the liver to this big pump that sends warm, oxygenated blood into the liver, and that can potentially keep the liver going for longer. I just show that because it's a, this is a normal thermic pump. All right, let's talk about xenotransplants. This is where we're using pig organs. Um, so I got to tell you this. This is interesting. The first xenotransplant in the I'd like to say in the world, but I, I've got in the US right now was actually performed in my university in 1964. And there's a really interesting story about this. There was a um, scientist that was kind of experimenting with this, and he wanted to use baboon kidneys in a baboon uh, into a human, and uh, it was illegal. There was no IRB at that point in time where they had a research protocol and things. So, but they thought they could make it done happen. So what they did is they kind of in the middle of the night they made it seem like an operation. They anesthetized a the baboon and put them on a, a gurney pushcart, and they just covered them up and uh, took them to the operating room and did the operation. And the nurses in the room didn't recognize what's going on. They just told the nurses that this is a very hairy person, and they did the operation there. They just shaved him and they said, "This is just a very hairy person. Don't worry." They, they never knew this. The nurses and the anesthesia doctors never knew there was a monkey in there. Um, they thought it was human, and the organ actually worked for a couple of months, believe it or not, uh, before the person died. Uh, so that was not really done legally, so I can't really, I don't think we can claim credit for that. But um, this year, actually, this uh, three times it happened. The University of Maryland and John, uh, the University, I mean, UAB, uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham, and uh, 
uh, NYU, New York University, uh, did pig organs. What they did is they did genetically altered um, pig organs. They put them in humans, and they can just to, as a proof of concept that it could work. That the organ would not reject it immediately. A human cannot take an organ from a different species because it'll recognize the genes that are there and automatically kill it off. But if you can knock out some of those genes that makes the body recognize that as a as a foreign object, it'll think at least it's a human organ and potentially might accept it. So uh, we have a gene editing technology that allows for what we call gal knockout things. It knocks out the gal gene, which is what makes it a different species organ. So xenotransplant is uh, a transplant between species. Uh, human to human transplant is called an allotransplant. So we can trick the body to think it's an allotransplant. Um, so this year, two kidney transplants and one heart transplant was performed in the United States with any limited success, and this was done as a proof of concept. So we're very, very excited. This is the first time ever that it has been done um, this way. So this uh, we're waiting for patient trials. Our hope is that within the next five to ten years, this will be something that we can actually have a ready supply of pigs. But it comes with a whole bunch of ethical consequences as well, too. And I was we were talking about that before. Um, how is this going to work? I mean, potentially we can get so many organs from a pig, you know, think about uh, aside from the liver, lungs, intestine, heart valves, um, uh, blood, eyes, kidneys, heart, all of this potentially would use the, from pigs. And the reason we choose the pig is because there's a model for it already, right? Uh, we already have pig farms where, you know, pigs are grown for and harvested for the meat. So that, that already the pig farms exist. Even though a chimpanzee is closer to a human than a pig is, Many of us think kind of things unethical to kind of grow chimpanzees just for organs. We don't think it's as unethical to grow pigs because there's already a model for that in the in the world. But the, the problem is uh, there's a lot more that goes to this. These are very specialized pig farms because these are uh, genetically modified pigs. They're very very fragile, so they can't be allowed to mix with other pigs because they get diseases. Plus, the genes are grown in very sterile environments, so they don't get uh, viruses that pigs have. There is a virus called PERV, P-E-R-V, uh, porcine retrovirus. Uh, which pigs have that humans can't tolerate, so uh, we don't know enough about it. So these pigs have to be isolated because they're genetically altered, so they have to bear that actually expense. Um, how is this going to be done in the future? Are hospitals going to have veterinary hospitals next door where they can kind of transfer the organs? We don't know. The ethics about this, um, like I said, there is a model for using pigs, even though chimpanzees probably be better. We've chosen to use pigs because pigs are, you know, we've got a model for that. But think about this, you know, there's a whole subset of the world that will have nothing to do with pigs, right? Muslims and Jews will not take these organs, right? Because it's coming from a pig. So if we are going to ostracize a whole segment of society of the world, is this fair? So there's a lot of questions coming about that as well, too. And even infections, we still don't completely understand the infections that animals can get that humans don't have. The person who got that heart transplant at the University of Maryland lived for about two months. But he died of an infection uh, that you know we didn't know about. So. And there's still a little things that we have to look into to make this better. But once again, the proof of concept is there now for the first time ever this year. This has been a very exciting year for transplant, but more to come hopefully within the next five, 10 years. And last, let's talk about 3D printing. You know, we are able to now, with 3D printers are amazing. They can print anything that you want and we can potentially print organs and, you know, fuse them with stem cells so they can, you know, figure, um, you know go into something. So there's something called bio ink that we use. These are human uh, stem cells that are embedded in uh, gelatin, like a gelatinous material, and that's what they use as the printer for the as a material for the 3D printer. Um, already, human skin, nerve tissue are already being used in uh, clinical settings. Uh, this already exists. Uh, solid organs are still in development. In 2019, uh, Tel Aviv University in Israel made the first uh, 3D printed heart. Uh, it was only this big, so it was actually proof of concept again. It, it's not going to work in a human, but it, it worked. It actually pumped uh, when, they, when they put blood into it, so the proof of concept uh, exists. And these are all the potential organs that we can do with 3D printing if we, you know, if we give it enough time. So once again, this is very, very preliminary stage, but once again, the future is looking really bright for transplant with all these new things that are coming about. That was my last slide. So I, once again, I thank you so much for your attention. I hope this is interesting for you, and I would really encourage questions. Uh, just not sure you not just that you're interested, but you know that you want to learn more from this as well too. So I would welcome any interaction if I could. Thank you so much for having me here. So for the sake of the audience, uh, I'd just like to highlight the differences between the US and India. So in the US, uh, I think majority are Disease donor transplants. That's correct. Whereas uh, in India, these are 90 95 percent have 
give it the dependence. But a lot of it has got to do with the needs and the lack of the knowledge regarding the creation of the brain death. And uh, now regarding the uh, regarding naturally uh, supply to the demand, what is the uh, the uh, law in US regarding uh, matching pediatric disease proneness to other recipients and vice versa? How do you that? Uh, so we talked a little bit about the uh, scoring system, the KDP and the EPTS, right? The KDPI score uh, is, the, is a score for the donors, and age is one of the factors into it. So a younger donor tends to have a younger uh, KDPI score. Um, and same thing with the EPTS score, which is the estimated post-transplant survival score for the recipient, a younger age is going to get you a better score. So younger kidneys always match. So pediatrics will probably get prioritized for pediatrics, but part of the problem with pediatric donors is how big are the kidneys, right? So the kidneys tend to be very small, the vessels are very small, so it's hard to do that operation. So sometimes if the organ is too small, we might have to use both the organs to reduce them on block and we might have to use that. And I'm a little scared to do that in a pediatric recipient, so I use those kidneys in adults sometimes. And even though they're small kidneys, if you give them time, they will grow. So the fundamental difference between the uh, weight listing, which is followed in the US and in India, is uh, they have a lot of criteria scoring system, whereas in India, it's Really, very simplistic. Uh, unfortunately, where yeah, there is no extra scores for the uh, yeah, age or the pediatric status, it's just first come, first serve basis in majority of the centers. And uh, in Karnataka, there are three areas which have the uh, waiting list, the disease donor list. One is the Mysore Bangalore area, the other one is close to Karnataka, and then the North Karnataka. So each center follows their own uh, list, waiting list. It's like first come, first serve. That's when it comes first. Gets the uh, uh, list, he gets the priority. And uh, one more thing is, uh, depending on where the organ is harvested. Supposing the organ is harvested in uh, Ramay Hospital, the in-house in waiting person gets the priority, but gets one kidney. The other kidney goes to the general pool. So how is it then? Uh, so kidney is allocated by the CAS score. The CAS score by, it goes, it goes by how old you are. So everybody, everybody in the country gets a yeah. score, but there are approximately points. The closer you are to that donor, you get extra points. Uh, so it goes by what is the highest CAS score by that blood type gets that. So we don't generate a list. There is a national waiting yeah. system. So it's a producing organ. If it's a very good genetic match for somebody across the country, that person across the country will get it. We call that a six antigen match. Uh, so it's, you talked about why we have where we do this in the United States. The cataract system in the United States exists, but it is ridiculously expensive. You know, to keep a dead person alive in an ICU for a couple of days uh, before we can harvest the organs, that costs money. To take an organ out and put in a plane and fly it across the country or fly a team from across the country to come in to take out the organs, all of that costs, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and it is so expensive. Uh, and smaller countries just can't afford to do it. So the system as it exists in the United States is good. But it's very, very expensive and may not be re reproducible. Now, in Europe, they have something called Eurotransplant, where different countries kind of share between each other across borders because European countries are much smaller. The United States is a huge country, but and India is a huge country too. So I can see that being a problem in the United States that we don't have the logistic to kind of send a kidney from you know Kanyakumari all the way to Delhi, you know, in, within a couple of hours. Now, India usually is not interstate. Yeah. Very rarely mm -hmm. is it this, except for probably heart. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Right. For kidney, it's usually within the city or within the, uh, the state. Correct. The distance traveled by the organ is very less compared to. That's why we don't have the concept of the special for kidney. Uh, because the, the, the time take time is, the is very yeah. less. Uh, what is the status of unrated uh, living uh, transplants there? It's allowed. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah, but we don't even care if you as long as you're not getting paid to donate an organ, that's against the law. Yeah, but then we never know. We, so everybody that wants to be a potential living donor has to undergo a psychological evaluation where we kind of try to, well, you know, they see a social worker and a psychologist, we try to get to say, how do you know the person? Because sometimes you do get, you know, these, uh, I, I just know that this person on the internet sort of thing. So, but even that will allow, you know, we, and it's, social media is a new way of the world, right? So we tell people, advertise for it, you know, uh, people put billboards up, people put bumper stickers in the car, I need a kidney, please call this number. Uh, that this is a, this is the people have sold Facebook pages, and there are Facebook pages even for people to meet each other. So what we thought was unethical before is the new way of the world. Social media is here to stay, and people will find friends on social media. And 
So be it. This could be any place in India, because as of now, as per law in India, uh, fertility is not allowed, except in certain exceptions. Woman has to be admitted to the India. Uh, any, talk, any thoughts about the robotic uh, transplants? Yeah, so uh, we'll start with ourselves. Um, we are using robotic donors, but robotic transplants are a relatively new concept. And initially, we kind of question ourselves, is there any benefit in doing it? But you know, they see the times, it's all that time, is there any benefit doing that? But what I do see an advantage of doing that is in super obese people. Now, we do have a weight limit cutoff for who can get a transplant done. For us, it's a body mass index of 40, which is pretty damn big. But uh, you know, there are people who are, and the reason for that is because other people tend to have more complications. They don't heal well. They can't get up and walk. They can't tend to get more infections and pneumonias and blood clots and stuff. That is a problem. But there are some people that are disadvantaged by it. They're otherwise pretty healthy, but just happen to be fat. So if I can do a minimally invasive operation and do it, maybe I can offer a transplant to people that would never have gotten a transplant before. So we're doing two things for obese people. One is uh, we have, we've started a new program where we combine bariatric surgery with transplant surgery. Uh, weight loss surgery is gaining in the United States. People are getting surgery and lose weight. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the comorbidities that they have because they're obese are going away. They have transplant them as soon as they get lower. But if they have a living donor, I might consider robotic transplant. So uh, I've we've not done one yet. I'm actually going to a course that's in two weeks to learn how to do it. Because uh, India is one of the countries where we have the largest number of robotic, uh, one of the largest in the world. Uh, that's primarily because in India, as compared to surgery is done by urologists, majority of the kidney transplants. The urologists, as such, have more exposure to robotic surgery. They do a lot of robotic damage, partial prostates, partial nephrectomy for kidney cancers. So we are more uh, in touch with the robots. So that's why the probably the reason why we are so many robotic transplants being done in India. Probably, yeah. From Anything else in the audience? Yes, sir. No, it's good. There you go. Uh, first, uh, first place, uh, I congratulate you. Too. I don't know. You did mention that there is a 100% uh, success rate in uh, our country. Normally, they've done that. Was, that was just my program for that one year. So. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, that's only one year. One so year. that's only just one year. So it will save us of yeah. uh, increasing number of years of follow up. But uh, a good center here in India is around 99. So the, really good how big the child is. So I, the youngest one probably, I want to say maybe two years. Uh, but that, that child is big enough that I could put a kidney inside them, right? If the kidney is so small, the, the child is so small, I can't, I can't put a kidney inside. There's no place to put a kidney because uh, the belly is so small. So they, I, we normally wait for them to be at least 10 kilograms that I can potentially squeeze something in there. So I go by weight. Uh, so I'd like them to be more than 10 kilograms if I could. We did them in, in this hospital, and you are hospital. That's the end of your own child. Yes, yeah, they they about, uh, about two decades back, you know? 1984. Okay. The child happens to be from my village. Yeah. So we did, see, they did it here. You know, the, uh, the, the, what was the cost? Cost was only a 45,000. <laughs> That's also we got it from CM Fund and PM Fund I did. Managed. Anyway. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank for you, sir. Uh, no questions? I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned about that. Is this only hemodialysis or is there more? All dialysis, all dialysis. So you qualify for a kidney transplant if your GFR is less than 20. So if kidney is less than 20% approximately, you qualify for transplant. So you don't even have to be on dialysis to get a transplant. In fact, the best results are those who get a transplant before they start dialysis. You know, kidney failure is kind of like a downward slope. And the longer you stay on dialysis, the, 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 the longer the lower the slope gets. And if you get a transplant, you stop over there. You'll stay over there. You'll, stay, uh, you'll kind of plateau over there, but you never get that back up. So you want to transplant somebody as soon as possible. So the higher up that slope you transplant somebody, 
the better long-term outcomes you'll have. So in fact, the best outcomes are those who don't even start this work, but didn't even start dialysis. So there's a big push for us to do what we call preemptive transplant. So transplant somebody before they start dialysis, who will save the whole cost of dialysis, which is simply ridiculously expensive, uh, those we could. But the problem is most of these people don't have insurance, and they get insurance after they start dialysis. And that's where the problem is. So I can't, I'd like to do preemptive transplants. I'd like to transplant them before they start dialysis and completely bypass dialysis. But they don't have insurance, and they have to start insurance, dialysis just so they can get insurance. And that's what we're trying to change in the US. So what would be the cutoff There's no cutoff here. There's no, as long as you're healthy enough to get a transplant, you should get a transplant. And like I said, that scoring system that we had, you get more points the longer you've been on dialysis. You get one point per year for each year of dialysis you've done. For some reason, 17 years, of, and mostly we transplant people who have scores like six to eight. For some reason, like 17 years of dialysis would be really, really high up on that list. So in India, so I I'd like to see that we may be in the running for this. I don't know hundred percent know, but um I transplanted I did somebody's second transplant a couple of years ago and her first transplant was 45 years ago. She got it when she was a child and now she's in her she's in her late 40s or 50s or something. And now that kidney failed. It was a it was from a twin sister, that's probably one of the reasons it lasted that long. But uh, she came in for a second chance and now uh, 45 years after the first one. And I'd like to claim that's maybe the oldest, and I don't know if there's anybody more. I, I'm here all evening if you want to. Is there any town in which actually take on the future? Do you have any trustworthy? So how would it work for the until it's really, really well, so you're right. There are several countries in the world that have what we call universal health care, right? So there's a national health system, and there's pros and cons to that. Um, so, you know, even in countries like Britain, where they have national health system, we hear that their waiting list is very long because everything is slower because everybody's kind of pushing for it. Uh, with private insurances, things can potentially get a little more streamlined and faster. That's what the United States believes because it's a capitalist country. Um, so yes, there's no universal health care in the United States. Uh, only potentially relatively people can afford good health insurance. Uh, people who are old automatically get insurance who are about 65 years of age. People who are really poor also get insurance. But there's a big gap in between the people are not getting insurance because that people don't want to pay for it. Um, so uh, Medicare insurance pays for either give you coverage once you start dialysis. But as we said, one of the things that we're trying to work with the government is why don't you start let that kick in before? Like once the kidney function goes below a particular amount, why don't you let it kick in then? Why do you have to wait for it to kick in after the start dialysis? That doesn't make sense to us. So we are trying to work on that specifically. Yeah, no, 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 so there are government schemes, government schemes in India. Uh, is it through the government hospitals or private hospitals? Uh, the government and private hospitals which are in parallel with that scheme. So like we have at Ramaya, we have the uh, both the Andhra Pradesh scheme as well as the Karnataka Aravya Karnataka scheme. So we do any of these three tasks. So the government will take care of the government will take care of the expenses. Yeah, but that's what we, can, we can't pay for investment. And that is the problem we have the US too. I think that's, that's why we only pay for three years in the United States. And after three years, we'd have these people falling off a cliff. So we had to fight for them to pay for it indefinitely because it's still cheaper to pay for it indefinitely rather than have somebody fall off a cliff and put them back for another transplant list. So it's just making the system complicated. So at least it's part of it. Part of it
I think uh, any questions to the web? Any questions to the web from Comhead? No, no questions. I, I think uh, Professor Jerry did I pass present the Comhead because this month my term is over. Somebody else is taken from Mumbai being elected be there and he wants to say a few words about Comhead for having uh, allowing us to function in the institute for the past two years. Professor Joey, you know. Sorry, I'm not a professor, practicing pediatrician. In the first place, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Satish and Dr. Srinivasan for providing this uh, platform. For the last two years, they have provided everything free. This is what academic it is. If at all we claim that we have done something, continuous educative program, only just because of their large hearted and providing all these uh, facilities. Sir, we admire you, our affection, our respect, above all, our love for your generosity and supporting for this academic activities. Thank you, sir. Uh, other thing is, so look at this scenario, <laughs> today's scenario. He is a father, <laughs> his son. What can any father can expect more than this? <laughs> Son has achieved more than father. Probably he proud. That's what I said. I, I'm a proud father. <laughs> That's what I said. Anyway, I think while thanking uh, this speaker and the chairman, wonderful way, moderating and commenting, a token of appreciation for our institute in need of science. I request Professor Srinivasan to hand over this small momento to the speaker and the chair. Now I request uh, the, giving the word of thanks for Madhu. Madhu is a professor uh, from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences. He is the secretary of the Comhat, and his term also ends with us. And thanks again. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, as a official thankful uh, words from uh, Jyoti sir to the Center for Climate Change, yes. Dr. Satish sir and Professor Srinivasan sir, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to conduct these programs for two continuous years. We are very much grateful to you, sir. We thank all the attendees, the students, the staffs who are all supportive and also been the delegates for our conference the last week what we conducted. We thank our chairman for the day, Dr. Ajit and Dr. Anil Parmesh for his talk. Uh, it was a really uh, informative talk from uh, today's uh, topic and also a beautiful discussion post talk, uh, the comparative statements to national and international comparative statements. We thank you and we also thank Parmesh sir, our president, Comhat, uh, India chapter, for being a source of inspiration to conduct these programs monthly. And in spite of COVID uh, scare worldwide, we were able to uh, conduct these programs offline. 
oh, sorry, uh, online uh, as a part of uh, webinars. We have conducted successfully all months without any gap in between. Thank one and all for all this support which have been uh, granted to Comad India and also a uh, big thank for uh, IAC, the which uh, Center for Climate Change for all the support what you have got up till date. And thank you one and all. Thank you. Sir. Thank <laughs> you. 